Okay, so the last time we opened up Matthew 4 and we looked at the temptation of Jesus when he went out into the wilderness, and we see that Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness for 40 days in order to be tested by the devil. So he was led out by the Spirit to go out and show the devil who was, uh, who was boss, because the devil was going to be able to tempt him. So we see Jesus overcoming the temptation through the inspired word. He goes back to the word, and that's how he defends against all the temptations of the devil, is using the word. And this is a model for us to learn from and to follow. So let's get back into Matthew 4, um, and we'll start at verse 12. So John the Baptist has been arrested by Herod, and Jesus goes north to Galilee, to the city of Capernaum a city on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And this is the area that that was given to the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. So when, when the tribes of Israel come into the land, Israel is all divided up into different, you know, different sections, and it's divided up by this, I think, by the size of the tribe. So the larger tribes get larger pieces of, pieces of land. And so Zebulun and Naphtali are up in this area. It says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah. And this is a reference to Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. So what is this talking about? Zebulun and Naphtali were the first to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians. So remember, after Solomon uh, became king, um, right around that time, it was the Israel was divided into two into two. Uh, two countries basically it was israel and judah the southern tribes of judah and the northern tribes of israel and um did we just talk about that no i taught on that on on the, um, the other week at our community in israel all the kings of israel were of the line of david and that's what god had promised david that through him all the all the kings would come through him but in israel was the uh, jeroboam i think was the first king of israel and they're from the line of ephraim Okay, so they're all Ephraimites, all the kings on, on, that, on that side. Um, and so J Israel is the first to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And then later, um, Judah gets taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Okay, so the first to get taken by the Assyrians were the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. And according to Isaiah, Zebulun and Naphtali would, would be the first to have the light would have Messiah shine on them. So this is Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2. But there will be no more gloom for her who waves, who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Talking about God. God putting this punishment on them. He treated them with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see great light. Those who live in dark land, the light will shine on them. Okay, that's the first passage that's quoted. Now the second passage is Isaiah 60, and verses 1 and 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. So although um, Galilee had a larger Gentile population, there was still a strong and thriving Jewish community there at the time of, of the first century. So Jesus came to the Jew first. He came for his own. He came for the lost tribes of, of Israel. Um, and when it, says, when it says that, when he says, I came for the lost tribes, he's talking about they're lost from God. Okay, so he's coming, calling them back to God and to their covenant relationship with God. And, but the Gentiles would come later, and we find that out at the end of Matthew. 
that then Jesus will tell his disciples, now go out to the Gentiles and bring them in. So would you say that again, that, that when they're called the lost people, <coughs> means what? They're, the uh, they're just lost from God. God. They're just wayward, Okay. basically. And so he's calling, and that's what John the Baptist was doing, right? Make, make his right. path straight. Right. Get right with God. But, um, yeah, there are, there's a uh, lost tribes theory that, that um, the tribes, that, like I mentioned, the ten tribes of Israel were taken into Assyria, into Assyria, and then the two and a half tribes down in Judah were taken into Babylon. So people say that those are the lost tribes. We don't know where they're at. And Judea, since it's called Judea, they say that's where the Jews are at. They're from the tribe of Judah, but all the other tribes are, are lost. Hmm. And um, so there's a whole there's a whole big theory and, and um, a lot of uh, debate uh, uh, about all that. But we do see after they come back from captivity, all the tribes are identified again. So they, right. they did come back, or at least representation of each of them come back. And we even see that in the New Testament. There's a few tribes that are mentioned, people that are from different different tribes. And then when we see James write in a letter, he starts off his letter by saying to the 12 tribes that are abroad. So if he's writing a letter to the 12, 12 tribes, I mean, we know we know where, where they're at. But we, Do you have a period of time how long they were gone? Um, 70 years. Wow. 70 years in captivity. Yeah. Well, unsaved is to refer back to them instead of lost. Like right. Unsaved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, just kind of, they've gone wayward. They've gone away from God, so they're trying to you know just bring them back. Wayward. Right. We know where they're wayward. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, how many years I heard was there between the capture of Judah as to Israel? That I, I don't know. I mean, it was quite a while. It was a long time, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. But I believe, I believe the whole captivity was 70 years. That you're talking about when they when they took him to Babylon. Yep. Yeah, and, that, and Daniel never did go back, did he? I don't think so. I think Daniel spent his entire um, in life, yeah, in captivity did in the Babylonian take captivity. Did they both Judah and Israel to Babylon? Well, Israel uh, Israel was taken by the Assyrians, mm-hmm. but then when the Babylonian Empire rose, they took over Assyria. And so you can imagine they took over their slaves, which were these, some of them were these Jews. So these Jews were brought into Babylon. And then when they brought in the rest of the Jews from the land, that's when we understand the Jews, they came, they came together in Babylon. And then through Nehemiah, they come back to Israel and they re- restore the temple. And, and uh, that's how they get back into the land. Okay, and... Okay, I'm going to get to that here in a second. So, like I said, Jesus comes for the Jew first. The Gentiles will come later. But we can still see an illusion in this passage of the future in gathering the Gentiles. Because it's called called Galilee of the Gentiles. Matthew keeps us aware of this and that ultimately Jews and Gentiles would be redeemed in the same way. Jews and Gentiles would worship God in the same way. There's not a separation. So... Um, the law was given to the Jews first, but ultimately it's for everyone that's brought into the family of God. Okay, this one isn't more important than the other. We just went through Colossians, and in, in Colossians 3 and verse 11, Paul's making it clear. There's no difference between man and woman. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. There's no difference between slave and free. And what that means is, in the eyes of God, everyone's equal. If we're believers, if we're part of his elect, part of the chosen... We're all equal. There isn't one that's that's better. And again, in the in the messianic camp, you see a lot of people trying to find a Jew in their family. They're shaking their family tree, wow. hoping a Jew falls out so they can say, "I'm part Jew." Really? Yeah, yeah, because I think it, it gives them some status or something. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, and and all we need is Messiah. We're in Messiah in the messianic camp, in a in a, the groups that I'm that I'm a part of. Um, they, yeah, but who's trying to shake their family tree? I've met a lot of people. I've met a lot of people that do that. Yeah, yeah, and they try to say that they have some kind of Jewishness in their family, just so they can say, "Yeah, I'm part Jew," even though they, even if they were, I did, I have, I know, I do know people who, they genuinely do have Jewish um, ethnicity. Yeah, but they weren't raised in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
they weren't raised, they were raised Protestant or they were raised without sure. church at all. But they still want to, you know... It seems pretty prideful, like God's not going to honor that. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. I mean, Paul does say there's benefit because the Jews brought us Messiah. They brought us the word. Um, but God doesn't view them better than than others. It's kind of like here in the United States, you know, that um, people who are native born are no better than those who immigrate properly <laughs> and become and become part of the of right. the uh, the nation, you know. But there are certain rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone can immigrate and they and they could become part of the nation, but they can never be president because they weren't born here, you know. So it's just kind of like with the tribes of Israel. Only uh, one of the sons of Aaron from the from the Levites can be a high priest. If there's someone from the nations that joins Israel, they can't be a high priest because they're not of that line. Mm -hmm. Have you we tracked know, that so, through our presidents? What's that? We tracked that through our presidents. Like, they're, you know, it'd be interesting to know where the people we put in charge of this country are. Well, that was what right, they tried yeah. with Obama, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, that what they tried he wasn't born. saying he wasn't born here. Yeah. He was born in wherever that was. Uh, oh, Nigeria or something. Nigeria. He never lies. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Him and Michael. I mean, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's bad. Oh, that's... He's done that four or five yeah. times on camera. Yeah. Who has? Obama calls Michelle and Michael. Oh, really? Oh, slips. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, disgusting. Don't get me down that rabbit hole. No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I got pictures. Okay. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus, he goes up to the wilderness. He comes back. He meets up with John. He gets baptized. And it's like we talked about. It's like an inauguration of his ministry. And now he's going out and he's preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So according to John's account, uh, John's gospel, as, as we when we go through... Um, the Gospels. It's good for us to kind of be reading the other, the other Gospels and see, you know, what what are they saying about the same the same uh, uh, passages that we're on and seeing just the differences. You know, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, are kind of the same, but they might have little details. Mm -hmm. um, but John's going to have even more detail, even from a different perspective. He's got a different audience. So, according to John's account, Jesus had already been teaching before he came to Capernaum. So before he comes to Capernaum, he's already been around. He's already been going out to teaching in other places. This was not the beginning of his public ministry, but rather the beginning of the light being shown in this area as prophesied by Isaiah in, in the Isaiah passage. Because it said <coughs> they would have the light. Okay, the light would come to them first. Um, so if he was preaching and teaching before he was baptized by John? Uh, no, but probably before he made his way up to Capernaum. Oh, okay. But in in the um, in your Bible, if you've got a study Bible, um, or at least I know in my translation, in the New American Standard translation, when it's in in Matthew, when it's quoting Isaiah, which is a verse in verse sixteen, it says, "Sitting in the darkness, they saw a great light. The light, the L in that light, is capitalized." And then, and those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And again, that, that light is capitalized. Mm -hmm. In this translation, whenever they believe that it's a reference to God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, or it, it's gonna it's gonna capitalize mm. that. And so it capitalizes this light because they're understanding that it's a reference to to Jesus. Okay, it's not like that in Isaiah. But it is like that in Matthew because they're making that connection. So, so it's good to have a good good study Bible. But also, we have to be aware of the translators, the different translations that we have, because they they also have a bias. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why it's good to have a Bible that's translated by um, a group of people, by a committee, because they hold each other accountable, and they won't let someone go away. Uh, get off with you know having some kind of strange so translation. That's the case with the NIV. Yeah, yeah, the NIV. Um, I don't have a problem with the NIV. I know some people have have a problem with the NIV, but it is it's done by a committee, and that kind of translation. It's not a paraphrase. If you've ever had the Living Bible, mm -hmm. that's a paraphrase. Oh, yeah. Or the Message, mm -hmm. that's a paraphrase. 
Um, or the book. That was like... Mm-hmm. Was it a, par- a paraphrase? Yeah. yeah. But the new, the NIV, the New International Version, I've heard some people call it the not inspired version. Really? Yeah. But that's done by a committee, and I knew a pastor. I would go to his, his church, and um, and I would study under him. He taught very well. And he, that was his Bible, was the NIV. That's what he studied with. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's called a dynamic equivalent, the translation. Because they'll take like a whole phrase in the Hebrew and then they'll translate the whole phrase, the whole thought, and oh. translate it. Rather than the, N- the NAS and the ESV, those are word for word. Yeah. So that's why it's not as easy to read. But the NIV is easy to read because they take the whole thought and translate that thought. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you have a whole recipe over here, and then you have a picture of a cake over here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good, but So I like the NIV for, like, um, the Psalms and for um, Proverbs and for that, you know, for it's a good Bible to read with uh, for your devotions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so again, Jesus says, Repent for the kingdom is if heaven is at hand. We talked about that and what that's a reference to. It's a reference to returning to God, repenting, turning from our evil and turning back to God. By admitting what we've done wrong, confessing our sin, forsaking it, and then accepting God's standards of righteousness and forsaking the world's standards. And then living the new standard out. Okay, when we become a Christian, um, it's not enough just to say, yes, I accept Jesus and dunk in water and then that's it. No, then there needs to be a change in our life. There need, we need to start walking in a way that is prescribed by the Bible. As believers, as Christians. Um, And so Jesus is saying this. It's a call for repentance because the kingdom is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. So we need to be right with God. In um, many modern Christian churches and denominations, the gospel has been watered down. Um, I mean, Christian pastors admit it too. I mean, some, some churches, like, like maybe Joel Olstein's church, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's just yeah. watered down so much to where you can go to that church and be a homosexual, um, you could you know be yeah, a yeah. fornicator, yeah, yeah, you you could be doing all kinds of stuff and you're accepted as a Christian or even you're told it's okay, the way you're living is okay, you yeah. can live that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pastors are going to be held accountable for what they're teaching yeah. because they want to get their their pockets greased, you know, mm-hmm. so so. And that's the problem with big churches. You, you don't want people to leave because you got to pay the bills. So you want to tickle their ears so they keep coming right. and keep, you know, throwing money in, in the in the plate. So that no, way, no, 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 don't make them go like this. Yeah, yeah. Don't offend. You don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. But, Every time I went to church back when I was young, I was convicted of something. Yeah. I mean, it was really, you know. And that's what the do gospel that, does. Doing that, that's not good. You know, leave. Yeah, the gospel is the gospel is offensive. It's, and uh, so Jesus comes with this call to repentance. Um, but today, there's a pastor I like. His name is Dr. Michael Brown. I don't think he's a pastor anymore, but he's a he's an author. And uh, he says in this article, we've tried to make Jesus acceptable to sinners rather than making sinners acceptable to Him, removing the call to submit to His lordship and live a new life in Him. And we have refined repentance, reducing it to a mere change of mind rather than a change of direction, specifically a turning from sin and turning toward the Lord, and about face by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit. So there needs to be physical, um, we need to be able to see that change. I think we always bring up the passage, faith without works is dead. So if you're not demonstrating that in your life, do you really have that saving faith within you? Today, repentance no longer requires a change in a way a person lives. You can accept Jesus and still live like the devil. Accepting Jesus is like buying fire insurance. In, 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 that's the way people think of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, in case something bad happens, you'll be covered. Yeah. You know, I'm oh, at least I'm a Christian because I think if you're a, a, a believer, I know, I know. Like I said, I was brought up Catholic. I always knew about God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit. You know, I always wanted to live based on what I was taught. But once I was, it was explained to me that I had to actually live 
like a Christian all the time, I changed. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to church because I wanted to hear the Bible. And right. and I went to the the Monday night teachings and, I you know, mm -hmm. in, in small groups in the homes. And, you know, I just, I wanted to be immersed in the Bible all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that uh, that's what happens when a Christian comes comes to faith. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, we don't change in order to be saved, but we change because we are saved, mm -hmm. right? We don't change and then say, "Okay, now I'm in." No, we're in. Therefore, we want to we want to change. We don't have to clean up our act before God will accept us. And that's again, that's that what they call Catholic guilt. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought as as a Catholic. You know, when I uh, would would sin or you know would do wrong stuff. Man, God hates me. God's mad at me. I got to go and go to confession. I got to go do my penance and light some candles and you know yeah, do some somebody. things in order to in order to come in. Yeah, go tell some old guy my <laughs> sins. But no, I don't have to do anything. Jesus has already done it. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I'm ar I'm already in. I've already been accepted by God. Um, but like I said, if we truly are saved, we will change or we'll be convicted when we do sin. We'll have that conviction within us. Um, once we're born again, we see the, the error in our lives uh, by hearing the holiness inspired word of God. And that's why we need to hear the word, because if we're not listening to the word, then how do we know? How do we know that we've done something wrong? Mm -hmm. Preaching the gospel includes pointing out to the unbeliever that they are living in sin. So that's why people need need to hear the gospel. They need to understand what God's standards are. Yeah. People need to hear that fornication is sin. They need to hear that abortion is sin, homosexuality is sin. You know, there's so much that we see on the internet and on TV that is accepted. It's accepted behavior, yeah. and and. Yeah. And it's like it's okay, it's okay you can you can do it but no it's as believers our our standards are higher whatever's legal just because it's legal in Washington or in the United States doesn't mean it's it's okay for us to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you remember? I mean, when you were young, even on TV, they that everybody slept in separate beds. You know, right, like yeah. Ozzie and Harriet and all the rest mm -hmm. of those. I shows. love Lucy. And, uh, yeah, they all were. I mean, none of that was accepted to be able to even talk about something. Mm -hmm. And now they just little by little put it in there till you you start getting used to it and just think it's normal and it's just mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just look at the commercials for oh, I know it. medicine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the medicine commercials with men Horrible. kissing and yep. mm -hmm. I'm just like I know disgusting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's pretty bold. Mm -hmm. But if you speak against it, right. Yeah. Get canceled. Yeah. yeah. They really are they Christian they 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 think they're coming after the judges, but we're not the judges. God's the judge. We're just trying to get them, let them onto the script, yeah. script, you know. Right. They don't want to know about truth, the devil, these people. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything truth is like water on a right? Yeah. And and it seems that what they one of the things that I've heard people say is, well, back in biblical times these things weren't normal in society. But now, since these things are more normal, they are, they're more accepted. <laughs> no. Exactly. You know, and that's what I was going to say. And that's, and, that's, and that's why that behavior is mentioned in the scriptures, because it was taking place right. since, since people have been sinning. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, returning to God also includes worshiping Him in the proper way. Okay, so there are standards. God has given us his law. He's given us his instructions on how we're supposed to worship him, when we're supposed to worship him, what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. So God has specific things that he wants for for us to do. Back then they had the temple, so they would do the sacrifices at certain times, certain animals that they would sacrifice. They couldn't just bring any old animal. It had to be the animals that were prescribed by God that he accepted as clean for sacrifice. And there was a certain way to do it. They couldn't just sacrifice it anyway. Um, if we think of when they first created the temple, Aaron's first two sons, it said that they offered up strange fire. 
We don't know exactly. Sh- we're not exactly sure what that means, but they probably did something their own way. They did a sacrifice to God in their own way, and then right after that passage, it says that you're not supposed to bring a sacrifice to God while intoxicated. So they were probably drunk yeah. and offering up some, some maybe something that was supposed to, that was from a pagan nation offering up to God, mm-hmm. and he zapped him. He killed him right there. Mm-hmm. Um, because he's a holy God. You can only approach him a certain way. So how are we jacking the the rules for us? Well, what we believe is in Leviticus 23, we have all of the, all of the, the, the biblical holidays. And so that's why the Sabbath is the first one, seventh day Sabbath. So that's why we worship on, on the seventh day Sabbath. Um, and then we have all the other festivals, Passover, Pentecost, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, which will be coming in, in uh, two weeks after that, uh, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Sukkot. So those are the, those are the biblical festivals. Hanukkah, that's, a, that's more a civil festival. There's another festival called the Feast of Lots from the Book of Esther. That's also, even though that's in the Bible, it's not... It's not one of the ones that's that's prescribed specifically by God. So you feel like that's a requirement? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it says in Ezekiel, um, and, and if you understand that, if you believe that to be the temple when Jesus is reigning, he's the prince that, that's mentioned in that passage, it says that the nations will have to come up to Jerusalem to worship and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't, they're not going to get any rain on their on their land. So we just understand that these these festivals, Jesus did them, his disciples did them, and if you know we're supposed to be living like him, then we then we then we do them too. And we're not in Israel; there's no temple, so we still can't do them in the way that was prescribed. So what we do is a memorial. You know, we don't slaughter a lamb; we go to Costco and get a lamb to do that for Passover. You know, um, for the it's feast of. I really think there's room for debate there because I don't know where my scriptures are. I, mm-hmm. I know some place that it says do you like you know, you're not supposed to judge a um, person yeah. or which Sabbath they keep. And, you know, as I understand it, those were. The rules for the Jews, yeah. and Jesus came to fulfill the the law. So, you know. Yeah, no, I understand that. I, I understand that's that's the 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 prevailing um, teaching in in the in the Christian in the Christian church. Um, but the picture that we have of Israel when they're in the wilderness, it's a mixture of unbelievers or uh, non-Jews and Jews. It said when they came out. In the Exodus, a mixed multitude came with them, because you can imagine after all the the those ten plagues, when they left, it wasn't just the Jewish people; they had a lot of other slaves. So you can imagine all those other slaves said, "Hey, we're going to go with them. Look what their God just did." And even some of the Egyptians probably said, "You know what? We're, yeah, they just defeated all of our gods. I'm gonna, we're going to go with these guys." And so it's that group of people, the Hebrews. And this mixed multitude that came to the mountain, and they're the ones that God called Israel. Now He did still everything was divided up by the twelve tribes, but you can imagine those people they separated and joined those tribes, because as God's given the law throughout the the five books of Moses, He keeps saying there should be one law for the for the the native born. And the sojourner or the alien who dwells in your midst. And so that's talking about someone who's attached themselves and they want to be a part of Israel. So there's one law for both, mm-hmm. for Jew and Gentile. So, so from the beginning, we see that God says there's no, um, there's no distinction be, 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 between both. And even. Except that what about the dispensations? You know, I mean, it's a different dispensation from what the Jews had as compared to what Paul preached. He, Paul preached, he called it my gospel, you know. His gospel was different than the disciples. 
Right, yeah. And that's if you're a dispensationalist. Yeah, again, that's an, I mean, there's so many, I, yeah. you know, there's so many different uh, Christian yeah. uh, views. I am a dispensationalist. Be, I because Paul, some say that Jesus taught uh, pro-law because it was still, he hadn't died yet. And when he died, he fulfilled it. So then after he died, then they didn't have to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, they still did the Pentecost. Even Paul um, was trying to get to Jerusalem to go to the Pentecost. Mm-hmm. Even um, <clears throat> Acts 15, when they said, hey, Paul, they're saying that you're teaching the these these guys not to do the law. So you need to show them that you are by helping them fulfill their vow. And they think it's a Nazarite vow. So he took a Nazarite vow with these guys, and he went into the temple and helped them to do uh, a Nazarite vow. Mm -hmm. To demonstrate that, no, Paul was pro-law. And then there's those that say, well, the law that they have now is not, is only the moral law. But the civil laws and the, um, was it the ritual, I forget what how they, I forget how they divide it up, but they say that well, all we keep now are the moral laws. We don't keep the civil laws or the um, mm. is it the rituals or I forget, I forget I forget how they how they describe it. So no, I understand. I mean, and I'm, it's what this is what 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 people have have been doing, and um, but I see uh, for myself and for my family, I see the picture of Jesus in the festivals, um, his first advent in the spring festivals. And then his second coming in the fall festivals. That's been our focus now. Mm-hmm. Is when he returns, he's going to fulfill the fall festivals. It says that when he returns, it's going to be a, a, a shout. The, the trumpet of God is going to be blasted. Mm-hmm. It says that in Isaiah, mm-hmm. then, then Jesus mentions it. And even Paul mentions it. He's going to come back um, yeah, on, on the clouds. Yes. Some practicing from your house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we try. I know Mo's been blowing it. And I try and do it every morning. During this month. It's called the month of Elul. It's the sixth month in the Hebrew calendar. You're doing the shofar yeah. every morning. Yeah, I try really? to. We I try and blow it in, in the mornings, except when I go into work early because I'll, I'll let them sleep. Mm-hmm. But um, but that's how I wake them up um, because it's kind of a like we're saying, get ready. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The kingdom of God is coming. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus is, is coming. Down. So we so we blast the trumpets and we get ready for the feast of trumpets. Like I said, it's going to be in two weeks. When the feast of trumpets comes. It's announcing the arrival of the king. Like it, like we're talking about here. Jesus is coming, so we've got to get ready. So between the Feast of Trumpets and, and the Day of Atonement, it's ten days. Ten is a number in the Bible that's like for judgment, like the Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues. So there's ten days. And so in the Jewish tradition, they say that during that time, it's a time for you to get right with God, repent. So that way you'll be written in the Book of Life for the next year. Um, wow. Because they saw it as a, as a as an annual thing. It wasn't like forever. It was just for the next year. Wow! And then once uh, the Day of Atonement, all the sins are atoned for through the two goats that are sacrificed, and um, and then after that is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the celebration. Uh, it's a time. It's just, we celebrate God dwelling with His people, because He said, "Build me a tabernacle," right. and He dwelt with yeah. them in the wilderness. Well, Jesus came down in his tabernacle, in his temporary body, and dwelt with us in the wilderness here on, on, on earth. Mm-hmm. And so we see the picture of Jesus in, in, in these, um, and that's why I think they're just so rich, um, because it, it, it's, it's the whole gospel message in the, in the festivals. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's during the feast... They say everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Yes. Mm-hmm. And coming and things. So. Yes, and that's what we have to we have to be looking out for him as we read through the Old Testament and yeah. find him, because he showed his disciples, he showed yeah. himself in the Old Testament, and so it's 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 good for us to um, to be in the Old Testament along with the, and that's why I really like Matthew because he keeps pointing back to the Old Testament, mm-hmm. he keeps bringing these things in, just solidifying even more for these Ju- this Jewish audience. That Jesus is the Messiah. He's fulfilling all these different uh, passages. It's like we keep reading over and over, just like it is written. You know, right. it's, it's revealing Him. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So he's given us a way that we're that we're supposed to live. Um, and we have to remember that Paul says, when we were born again, we were freed from slavery to sin, but this freedom doesn't give us the license to live however we want. Paul says in Romans 6, having been freed from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. So we just go from one master to another. Yeah. And I remember when I first heard that, I'm like, what? I don't like the idea of being a slave to God. I've heard that some people, uh, there's one pastor I know of that he doesn't like to say Lord. Because Lord, Lord is, uh, in the Hebrew it's Adonai. But it, just, it, me, it can mean master. And he's like, he's not my master He's like my daddy, mm. you know. The, he's the father. He he loves me. He's, gonna, he's, but Paul tells us right here that we're slaves to righteousness. We're now slaves to God, and we see that when God brought them out of Egypt, He took them from being slaves mm. to Pharaoh, and then He brings them to the mountain and He gives them His law and says, "Now you're slaves to Me." Mm-hmm. Now He's the kind of master that we want to have. Because he's all loving. He's all good. He, all he wants is good for us. All he's going to do is good for us. So it's good for us to know that we are slaves to him. And so we have to be obedient to him. It says we're slaves to righteousness. How do we define righteousness? Faithful obedience to God. Obedience to his word. We're now slaves to do what he's commanded us to do. We're no longer slaves to our sinful nature. We're born again and we're a new creation. <coughs> When someone becomes um, a, a citizen of the United States, well, they're expected to follow the laws of the United States. You know, they come and, and they become an, a part of, of this nation. Once they become a citizen, the forefathers of the nation are now their forefathers. The history of the nation is now their history. The rules and the laws are now their rules and laws. I mean, they become part of the nation. And we can't say... I'm a better citizen than you because I was born here and you weren't. No, we're all equal. We're all equal in the eyes of the law. Except some people don't want to assimilate. So. That's yeah. That's when it's a problem because they're not they're not accepting the culture. They're not accepting, right. you know, what this this melting pot of what it's supposed to be. And 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 we can see that even like like you're saying like with a job because with a job, um. You can't just say, you know what, I'm not going to work this yeah, week. We'll yeah, you can't just do that. You can't just say, you know what, I'm not, I'm supposed to come in at 8. I'm going to come in at noon. Yeah. You don't call yeah. the shots. Mm-hmm. When you get a job, you have a meeting with the with your boss, and they tell you, this is when you're coming in. They give you the rules because they're paying you. You're mm-hmm. you're selling your time. Mm-hmm. You're selling your services. You're selling what you, what you can do. Isn't, it, isn't that wild? You know, it's just people that prefer jail over life because they get meals and they don't have to worry and make decisions. I've known people like that. Mm-hmm. I've known people like that. Around Thanksgiving, they do something to get thrown in jail. Why? Because they're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. Mm-hmm. They're going to have a, they're going to have Thanksgiving dinner in prison. Yep. Okay. Verse eighteen. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So I mentioned this before, but in in rabbinic uh, Judaism, um, in some sects of Judaism, the more orthodox or Hasidic sex, I imagine. Um, someone who's older, or uh, a young man, will go and find someone who's older and more experienced to be their mentor. And I mentioned to you the uh, Rabbi Schneerson, the guy who was, in, uh, who was the head of the Chabad, and he would find people, he would find Chabadniks, these, um, his followers, in his house, spying on him. They want to see how he lived, because they wanted to see how he wrote his was right with left hand or right hand. How did he hold his coffee? Did he hold it by the handle, or you know, how much sugar did he put? I mean, they wanted to, they want to mimic everything that that he did. So that's I mean that's kind of wild to to consider, but boy, I'd like to mimic my life after Jesus. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I'd like to live in the way that he did. You, when I was a graphic designer, one of the things that I learned was when you get a, you know, someone that you're working for, copy them, you know, and that's what I did with my bosses. I would, I would copy them and I would find out their habits and how they use their computer and, and I would learn from them until I felt like I was kind of at, at their level and then I'd find someone else to learn from. Um, but that's one of the ways that, that, that we learn it. And, and in olden times, you know, there was more of a mentor and apprentice relationships. And you're all supposed to be mentors. Yeah. That's yeah. Job. <laughs> I'm really not being okay. there. <laughs> a woman too. Okay. But, um, you know, the, the, during the times of the knights, you know, they had the squires and the squires would help the knight carry their sword around and, and you know, helped them in, the, in that way. Or even like in biblical times, the son was expected to take over the business of the father. So whatever the father was, that's what the son was going to be. Mm-hmm. A blacksmith or a carpenter or a farmer, a fisherman. You know, you see here these 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 uh, men were helping their father in the fishing business. Well, Jesus was perfect when their sons left them. Yeah. Yeah, you can imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> but the interesting thing about this scenario here is they weren't looking for a teacher. In this case, the teacher came and found them. So they weren't going and saying, I need, I'm looking for a teacher. The teacher comes by, Jesus, and he calls them. And he doesn't, he doesn't ask them. He doesn't say, hey, would you guys want to tag along? What do you think about it? Yeah, he commands them. Follow me, he says. Follow me. And if we see the picture of... If Egypt is a picture of the world, right, and it's a picture of them being slaves to sin, God didn't say, come out of Egypt. No, he went into Egypt and he pulled them out. So I th- I think that's a picture of us mm-hmm. that um, it's, it's a, I don't know, there, there's, there, there's, once God has that, you know, he, he calls us, then we're going to be pulled out. So these guys were just going about their regular business, and then Jesus comes along and says, come, he calls them. He calls them out of their occupation to come and serve them. And their occupation is like a place of provision. It's a place of security. It's a place of familiarity and safety. It's a place of normal and predictable outcome. They know what they're going to do. They get up, go to their 9 to 5, cast the net, get the fish, bring it home, eat some, sell some, Next day, do it again. You know, it was predictable. It was something that they were safe and, and felt comfortable in and something that, that they knew. But Jesus is calling them out of their comfort zone to come into a place where you don't know when your next meal is going to be. You don't know what you're going to be doing the next day. Every day is going to be a new adventure. He was calling them even away from their father. And I know that's what a lot of times our parents feel like a place of protection. I remember when, when we moved from Texas to Colorado, boy, I, I, I started realizing how much I valued my parents and how much I, I, you know, I wanted them around me. Even now, you know, I feel so far from, from my, my parents mm. and I still seek, you know, their wisdom and their advice on, on things. Um, but but Jesus called called them away from that, called them away from their, their father who they were working with and, Called them away from the family business because he had a job for them. And oh, by the way, he's claiming he's God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that would be the biggest one. Like, <laughs> and then all the kids jumped in and it was so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so or, he. You know, pay your taxes. Yeah. <laughs> so he calls them and how did they respond? Well, they immediately follow, they just get up. They, and the way that it's described is like they just get up right there and drop their nets and just... Yeah. You should see it in The Chosen. Oh, yeah, so yeah. powerful. I mean, you'd love it now because it's, it's uh-huh. right when he's taking them from the boat. He's right. together, The Chosen. Mm. Yep, yep, that's what he's talking he's about. Trying he's trying to remember He's, the he's choosing his disciples. Well, he's The Chosen. You um, believe, you'll be blessed by it. Just buckle down and make any plans. In the other accounts, in the other Gospels, it shows that there may have been some time in between um, and even more details that happened in the events. Um, but they didn't hesitate. The point is that they didn't hesitate in making the decision to follow 
to leave what they were doing and to follow Jesus, and their heart was to obey, even if it meant significant personal sacrifice. So that's the thing too. Is like, are we ready to sacrifice? Or you know the the things that we used to do, you know I left friends because I you know wasn't going to be drinking anymore, mm-hmm. wasn't going to be doing drugs anymore. I'm going to leave all that, leave all that, and mm-hmm. you know I think I've mentioned to you before that if if you were to talk to the people that I moved from Texas to Colorado with, they'd describe you a totally different person. Mm-hmm. I was living a different lifestyle. I was very selfish. I was a different. I was a different person. And so, and once I made that change, I mean, it, it, uh, it was, a, it was a serious, it was a true thing. And you could see that in my life. And so God does the same thing today. So he will get hold of us and he will call us. And how are we going to respond? You know, let me do this first. Let me, yeah. let me do this. Let me do that. Yeah. You know? But when God calls us, are we ready, are we willing, like these guys, in faith, Just dropped what they were doing and went to serve him? Mm-hmm. You know? How many how many opportunities have we had to share the gospel where we're just like, I don't want to say anything. Yeah. Or, I, I can't stop and talk to anyone, i got to get going, you know? Yeah. Or we're at our job and it's like, well, I can't stop, i gotta, I got to keep working. You know, because you were were a slave to the boss. Mm -hmm. So, so what were these guys doing? They were fishing. In our modern Western mind, we think of fishing. We think of a rod and rod and reel, a fancy lure, and a nice shade tree. You cast your line, and you wait. The lure, the bait, doesn't. doesn't work so you might get another bait and throw it on there you know i'm not a big fisherman i wanted to when i moved to colorado i thought i was going to be fishing a lot only went a handful of times in the 17 years that i was there but the guys that i went with they all had their own tricks they all had the little some used the bait you know the little balls and the little the little paste some had the reels i mean they all had their own tricks and oh you got to go under the tree because the the fish should go under the tree, or you got to go under the bridge, or you got to get in the middle of the water. You know, everyone had their, their tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah, everyone had their, their way of doing it. But these guys, uh, more than likely, they were fishing from the shore because Jesus comes walking by and he speaks to them. So he's not in the water, he's by the shore and he sees them. It says that they were fishing with nets. The nets they were casting into the water were weighted. So there were, they were rocks on the ends of the net and they would draw. Uh, they would draw the net down into the water quickly in order to catch the fish. So the fish are going to be in there schooling. And they cast the net, it falls on top of the fish, and then they're able to, to pull it in um, onto, you know, onto the shore um, or if they were in the boat and pull it into the boat. So they, that's, how, that's how they grab it. So now let's consider this fishing metaphor. The net was cast and the fish were caught. If they were going to be fishers of men... Men were the fish that were going to be caught, so what is the net? If they're going to cast the net, what was that? what is that? Well, it's, it's the gospel. The gospel is the net that's cast and it's pulled back in and men are caught. In Acts 2, in verse 37, after Peter shares the gospel with the Jews, this is at the, that Pentecost after Jesus' death. He's in Jerusalem. He, it says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. So, and and so these guys, they knew the law, but once they heard the gospel and it all came together for them, they were pierced to the heart. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's what mm-hmm. caused them to, to be born again. And so we can learn from this. The gospel is to be used as a fishing net. This is what the disciples of Jesus could conclude based on their experience fishing in the Sea of Galilee. The gospel is not to be used as a fishing lure. This is a modern way of looking at it. It's it's a Western mindset. When we try to use the gospel as a lure, we water it down. Oh, it's my daughter. We're almost done here. When we try to use the gospel as a fishing lure, we water it down and we make it palatable. But fishing with a lure is a trap. It's a snare. Mm -hmm. Right? You have the... You're... you're, uh, 
you, you're tricking the fish. It's not real food. So you trick them, and they they bite. Then you then you snatch them, and they get caught. They're hooked, right? They're fooled into taking something that they would have normally avoided. And we don't need to fool anyone into accepting Jesus. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it's the work of the Spirit in connection with the proclamation of the gospel that brings about repentance to God and faith in Jesus. So we cast out that net and we leave the work up to the Holy Spirit to pierce the hearts of the people. And God's the one that brings it in. He brings in the, the catch. He brings in the men, the people. And no hook marks. Yeah. <laughs> so don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't water it down in order to make it acceptable. In that same article by this guy, Michael Brown, he says, We do not win the lost by becoming like the lost. We win the lost by becoming like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And by presenting the Jesus of the scripture and the gospel of the scripture whether it brings offense or reproach or mockery. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's what we need to. Right. That's what we need to do. Don't water it down. Yep. So the cat so cast the net and let the net do the work. Mm -hmm. Cast the gospel and let the gospel do the work. Proclaim the gospel and let the, let the spirit of God do it do the work for you. Follow Jesus and he will make you a fisher of men. We don't need to learn tricks in leading people to Christ from popular evangelists. Okay. We don't need lures and bait. We don't need to water down the gospel. We just tell it like it is. You were born into sin. You're a sinner. Without the atoning blood of, of Jesus, you have no hope. Admit your sin. Confess your sin. Repent. Acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. Change your ways and live for him. And so we just we that's all we need to do. And, and those early... Um, missionaries um, Hudson Taylor I think is one of them when they went out to China wherever it was that they went they had that understanding that if God's doing the work all I got to do is go out there and proclaim the gospel so they went they went out with the expectation that they couldn't lose mm -hmm. all I got to do is go and say it people might laugh at me they might mock me but so what if, if, if God's winning souls through my obedience, so be it. I think people, their fear of rejection. That's why they don't speak exactly. out. But, it, but the rejection isn't on you. It's the rejection of God. Yeah. Yeah.